Good afternoon. Welcome to Northwestern Voices, and today my guest is my friend Kent Cease, fellow Rotarian and yes. president-elect of the, of the Rotary Club. So That's right. You had to remind me. That's right. <laughs> Coming up. So uh, Kent is currently uh, the um, driving force behind the Cease uh, Funeral Home in Park Rapids, right? Correct. And... Yes. Um, he uh, has been doing that for many years, and welcome, Kent Cease. Well, thank you. I'm <laughs> glad to be here. I'm glad to be here. Yes. <laughs> thank you for inviting me. Yeah, uh, I'm somewhat informal today, so and I like this format. Well, good. I don't, I don't really. I I'm, tend to be more informal and than to be a formal person. So all right. This is, yeah, we'll try to make it it's as very, informal as mm -hmm. possible. <laughs> yes, it's very so. The, Tell us a little bit about where you're from, where you went to school, and sure, stuff like sure. that. Yeah, I am. Um, it's, it's actually my golden year birthday, so I was born in 1962, and I happen to be 62 years old. All right. So I got to brag about that for a year. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I, I grew up in a uh, town north of here in Bagley, Minnesota, and went to school there. Um, I was a triplet growing up, so I... There was three of us, and most of the time, when people find out I'm a triplet, they say, "There's two more of you." Yeah. Oh my goodness gracious! <laughs> but no, we we had a pretty unique childhood. I'll say that um, because yeah. I always had my two brothers with me, and I had an older brother by two years and a younger sister. Yeah. And we we were um, <clears throat> grew up in a time where um, you did things. You were always involved in sports and in church and Boy Scouts were very involved in and we did a lot of fishing and we we're outside a lot um, camping um, so I had a wonderful uh, childhood I, I look back at it as, and just am, just feel very lucky to right. have that experience so um, but yeah growing up we were always in sports and the three of my th two other brothers and I were only in one sport together and it was hockey so Hockey was a lot of fun, and we played on outdoor ice yeah. back then. And we'd go home uh, from school, and then we'd get something to eat, and then we'd go downstairs, put all our hockey gear on, and then we, the three of us would jump on a snowmobile and go over to the hockey rink, yeah. <clears throat> no matter what temperature it was. Ten below, we it didn't matter. <laughs> if we had skates on our, on our feet, we were happy. Yeah. And um, so, and we have, all three of us were on the same line, so... Several times during the game, the coach would go, Cease line, get in there, get in there. It's like so, the Hansons. Yeah, yeah, we were. <laughs> yeah. So, well, and that was a fun sport. We did enjoy that. But, uh, and Kurt, one of, two of us played football, and my other brother was quite a very gifted runner. So, growing up. So, I'm assuming you're triplets, but that doesn't mean that you're identical, then, right? Correct. Yeah, okay. we were fraternal. Fraternal. Yeah. Okay. The other two look very much alike, and um, they. Their kids couldn't even tell them apart, but they were fraternal. Yeah. Is it true that in sets of triplets, there's a good one and an evil one, and then one that's kind of in between? And where do well, you fall in? You on know, that I would say that I was right in between. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right. And so <clears throat> we mentioned before that I, I guess I should probably ask you what your title is because you know there's so many different uh, titles that are associated with your business. There's undertaker and mortician and funeral director but but what is your official title you know t t um mortician is is the license from the state of minnesota it's a mort mortician's license so okay but i act i call myself an undertaker all the time you so do that's that's old time slang you know yeah yeah so that's so that's more that's just more of a like a slang term for somebody in, the, in your business yes yeah. yes yep. okay um at one time the state had two licenses um, mortician or our funeral director, and the funeral director could own a, could own a funeral home. They could be licensed as an owner, and they could conduct funerals and meet with families and discuss uh, different options for families. But they couldn't prepare a body, do an embalming part. So, and that uh, changed. Yeah, and now they don't offer that anymore. They think there's just a couple morticians or. Funeral director's license still in existence, and they're quite, you know, 
they're not in practice anymore. But So as we sit here today, if a person is a funeral director, they would also have to be a mortician. Oh, correct, well. yeah. correct. What was yeah. the reason for the policy change on that? Uh, you know, that's, that's a good question. My grandmother was a general director. Of course, my grandpa and I grew up in a funeral service family. Yeah, I was so, going to ask. Yeah, I was going to yeah, ask yeah, you yeah. about that. So, so um, how did your so you your your parents and grandparents were both in this business, right? How did it? How did they get into the business? That's good. Good question. Uh, um, uh, looking back, um, back when I was growing up, like my grandfather was a, just a wonderful storyteller, and uh, we all as grandkids do. A, uh, just appreciate your grand grandparents, and he he could he could relay things in story form. But he he moved up to um, in 1917. Um, he, he was born in 06, so he grew up a little bit in Iowa, and then his his brother and his sister and his parents kept moving north, and they ended up in Lincoln County for a short time. When he was 12, they moved to Bagley, Minnesota. And that was, I want to say, it might have been 1919 they moved there. And he worked at, he when they moved to Bagley, my great-grandfather was a well digger. And um, my grandfather worked at a drugstore. And the drugstore also provided a funeral parlor. So he, he didn't really work at the funeral part of it, but he worked at, at, behind the soda fountain as a soda jerk and he they also at, in in that time um would prescribe medicinal alcohol mm -hmm. which was during pro prohibition uh -huh. so <laughs> so it, he had a lot of stories about that too but sure. he ended up kind of just helping with the funeral service, funeral parlor of it and getting introduced to it and then he actually um a friend of his uh, his dad had a parlor too, and the two of them went to mortuary school together in yeah. the 20s, and they came back and um, they were going to be partners and uh, combine the two places into one. And both in uh, Bagley. Both in Bagley, and then he ended up his his friend that he went to school with ended up getting tuberculosis or TB, and then passed away. So. Um, at that after that point, my grandpa decided just to to work for one of the places, and he he started <clears throat> mortician work in the uh, mid twenties. Yeah, and then he bought the two places out eventually, and started Cease Funeral Home in the late thirties. So the first yeah. Cease Funeral Home was in Bagley, then. Yeah, in Bagley. How many are there today? I've got a brother in in um, Black Duck. He's uh, my brother Kurt is a mortician. There. One of the triplets. One of the triplets. Yep. And I've got an older brother, Kevin, and in Bemidji, and my sisters in Bagley, and I'm here. So. So there's four. Yeah, there's four. Okay. So you're. This is in your blood, obviously. It's you know right part of your yeah. family. And... Yeah, it is. It's just um, something I grew up. I was probably 20 years old when I figured out what I wanted to do, mm -hmm. and second year of college, and. Um, when I when I first decided to go into mortuary work, um, none of my siblings had declared that they were interested at all. So, I my my idea was to go back and work with my dad and my grandfather, mm -hmm. and then slowly my other siblings decided to to um, pursue mortuary science too. So, they we all been part of that. Yeah. So I've got you know there's out of five kids, four of us went into mortuary science. So. When you're a kid growing up, I mean, you know, a lot of times kids will help their parents out with some of this stuff, if, especially if it's a family business. Did you ever get involved in any of that as you were a child growing mm -hmm. up? And yes, yeah, yeah, we helped on funerals, and um, we did maintenance at the funeral home. We mowed, um, shoveled the sidewalks, um, and then uh, we eventually we started actually being grave diggers. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So, so, do you recall like, because <clears throat> you know, when when most people think about you know being a mortician and everything, it, one of the biggest probably barriers to at least psychological barriers would be to work on a day to day basis with a deceased 
uh, mm-hmm. person. Yeah. Do you do you recall like how you know you got kind of brought into that side of it or eased into it or you know do you remember the first time that you were actually in the presence of something like that? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yep. You do. You do. Um, some people re- are more easily adjustable, or you know, they can they can adjust their mindset. Um, and you know, it's you're helping a family out, of course. Right. Um, you're performing a, a duty that uh, is pretty sacred, very sacred, and and you know, you you, you take it very seriously. You know. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I, it, there was a time where um, as going through school that. That was kind of a barrier, a psychological issue, like you said, yeah. that you have to work through, and you got to be pretty well centered. So, um, was it yeah. school then? It was the first time that you were exposed to that. Well, no, growing up, we'd help, we'd help, maybe yeah. um, help my dad a little bit in the prep room, just yeah. what, what little that he, you know, back then it was maybe moving a casket around or bringing it in, and for for them to to get the person ready for viewing, you know. But, Do you remember any any specific guidance that your grandfather or your father gave to you when you were dealing with that sort of thing? Yeah, yeah, I do. Um, um, he he kind of led by example, both my dad and my grandfather did. So we just kind of followed their lead, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, a lot of that really you didn't get, you didn't get sat down and say this is exactly how you do it. Sure, you sure. Know? But, but just the respect that you have for people and the respect that you have for families and um you know i can't overemphasize that and just being trustworthy and being honest and open and um treating people golden rule you treat people the way you'd want to be treated you know it kind of seems like that would be something that would be hard for a person to get into if they didn't have a family background like that it is yes and I, i can remember in school um in mortuary school there was about maybe 20 percent that were family family um generational funeral homes um and then the rest maybe somebody had worked had lived next door and maybe helped drive or had helped at the funeral home got introduced that way and yeah um and i i i know some morticians uh were had had gone through a death of a family member, a grandparent, or something, and made a, a uh, an impression on them that you know how important that work is and how how helpful you can be in that position to families. Um, and they pursued that because of their experience of of the loss of a loved one. You know. So let's talk about the the services that a mortician provides. I mean, I know there's, you know, from like advanced planning until, you know, like that's one case, but then another case is a completely unexpected situation. So what, can you give an overview of that? Yeah, I, I think, um, you know, there's cremation, except, you know, people are, are very open to that idea and, and becoming more and more very popular for families. Um, so the cremation option is always there. Um, what happens between the time of death and when the cremation takes place is kind of uh, what we get involved in. Uh, maybe there might be a time for uh, a private viewing before cremation. Mm-hmm. If someone, if it is an unexpected death, um, sometimes we can have uh, preparation of the body and then viewing of that body or person be with a funeral mm-hmm. and then cremation followed uh, to follow that. And then, of course, the traditional services are um, with preparation of the body, embalming, and then um, uh, with the body present at the funeral, and then a burial at a cemetery. Okay. And that's for many, many generations that that was the norm, you know. So we're seeing a big change in funeral service right now. Mm-hmm. And people are um, choosing cremation um, very uh it's a it's a high percentage. What right? would you say that percentage might be? It's it's in in the state it's pushing seventy percent. Yeah, mm. um, this area is probably a little lower than that. Mm-hmm. Um, other parts of the state more uh, it could probably be as low as forty percent. But it's it's the part where 
uh, cremation and burial are cremation is overtaking in the burial part right now. It's, yeah. it's a higher percentage. Is that is that um, particular service completed here in in Park Rapids or is it done somewhere else? Back um, in O two, we we my brother had a funeral home. His original funeral home in Bemidji was on three levels. Yeah, um, it was built in the seventies and um, it worked very well for many years. Um, but eventually, we looked at the option of adding a more adding on to that that entry level which was the third level and we just decided we needed to move away from that location and so we moved two blocks over put uh his funeral home on one level and then made accommodations for a crematory so for since 02 we've had a crematory in Bemidji so and that's where that's yeah. where all of that service mm -hmm. is performed for all the different yep. funeral and homes. that's the only that's we only take care of families from our funeral homes there how how soon upon the discovery of the death do 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 you get involved in in the case? Let's say. Well, if if um, as soon as they need us, I mean it's mm -hmm. it's within hours, an hour okay. or two. Yeah. Yeah. And sometimes it's right away, within minutes. Yeah. They'll call and say, you know, we've been um, it's an anticipated death, and we're. We're all okay with the funeral home coming right away. And if it's a hospice situation, our local hospice will, they kind of handle the details about calling the funeral home and making sure that we're not there too soon, not there too late. Um, right, I guess either know, one would be, yeah. yeah. Sometimes it's it's imperative you get there pretty, pretty quickly and um, sometimes, you know, they need a few hours, you know, to be, let things happen. Because time and space just kind of, fall apart when you've lost somebody um and, and two hours might seem like 10 minutes to a family you know, you know sure. spending saying goodbye you know yeah um but yeah so being a mortician that's that's the hardest part is um covering 24 7 you know every holiday every night every weekend that. it's mm -hmm. it's um you're never off call so, it's kind of like a pastor. Right. <laughs> How many uh, employees do you have? We've got eight morticians and um, probably four additional staff, five, and we have some part-time people. Mm -hmm. um, Is that That's so, for all the homes? Yeah, for all our houses, or funeral homes, I should say. So yeah. do you guys, you, you, as siblings, kind of work together? Is that the yes. idea? Yes. Okay. Especially weekends. So we have half the staff on and half the staff off. On okay. Weekends, so that's what I was going to yeah. ask about is yeah. that, you know, how, how do you know who has to arrive and, you know, and all that yeah. stuff? So yeah. So we sit down like you went at a, in the conference room and we're all together and we're all, we all do 16 weeks of schedule at a time. Ah. Yeah. So, and then figure out who's going to work, which weekends and which combo and which holiday and, and, and all that. Yeah. And it, we'll go through the whole year and do all the holidays at once but yeah so it's just that's probably um the biggest change we're going to see is that we're, it's getting harder and harder to find people that are willing to do that work weekends and nights and i mean we're very lucky with our staff yeah and the, the dedication they have and, and why do you think that is i, I it's, it's it's got to be something with the uh, Current psyche of the, the youth, I, I, I guess. Um, um, I'm sure they're out there willing mm -hmm. to, but um, even in the northern part of the state, it's hard to find morticians. Yeah, there's a severe shortage of them. Yeah. Do you? Is there a next generation of C's to uh, that's interested in getting involved in this? Yes, I, my I, we have a niece. My niece has been my brother's daughter. She's been with us for a long time, mm -hmm. ten years or. In that neighborhood, and she's she works out well. Um, and she's got two cousins. Um, with my brothers, my one brother that's not a mortician, his son is a mortician, so he grew up kind of with his uncles and grandpa. And yeah, he, uh, so Charlie decided to go into mortuary science work, and so he's he's currently working in um, Roseau and War Road and Baudette, and he's been up there two and a half years. So the plan is to get him back here when he's ready. Yeah. 
Uh, okay. Yeah. So, 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 so there is so there yeah. is an, uh, uh, yeah. some reinforcements coming. Yeah. And then my sister's daughter is also a mortician. So yeah. and she's she's um, segue in and coming into this our the funeral home too. So uh, she's currently licensed and so there'll be three at least um, in the for, in the fourth generation, and they'll be cousins cousins. You know. Well, that'll be yeah yeah, and it's um, it'll be it'll be exciting to see all that come to fruition, you know, mm-hmm. and um, it'll give me some time off. Yeah. Sure. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. Well-deserved, yeah. I'm mm-hmm. sure. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, can you just kind of walk us, I mean, so you guys are getting called because there's been some sort of plan or arrangement that, that cease as opposed to so another funeral director would be responsible for, for everything, right? Right. So... Um, well, let's just say, you know, the the call comes, the first thing that you do would be to uh, I suppose greet the family and and then and then remove you, you, what, what do you, what's what's the proper term for this? Do you call it a corpse or a body or what what do you what's the uh, yeah, deceased? The deceased. Yeah, okay. Yeah, so yeah. then you would remo- yep. remove yeah. remove the decedent. Yeah. Yep. Okay. And um so then uh from there um, are, you know, there's you called it mortuary science, so I'm assuming that some something sort of scientific occurs. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's just, uh, yeah. I think back in the 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 degree itself uh-huh. um, with the University of Minnesota is called a mortuary science degree. Sure, so, sure. You no. Know, um, so there's just those preparations that are made. If you if you look at the if you look at getting through. Um, the mortuary science program, it's it's about. It took me two years of prerequisites to go to get the credits you need to get into mortuary science. So those credits are um, a sampling of many different disciplines. Um, you've got a year of of biology and a year, maybe a year of physiology and then sociology, psychology. Um, I took a half a year of accounting and business mm-hmm. courses. So mm-hmm. you're taking a lot of different, and, and that's, uh, you know, different disciplines and bringing it in. So that's what they require. It's a broader, broader degree. So, okay. um, so, so you, you need all those things too. in in the, cause you're, you're working, um, you're conducting a business and you're, you're trying to make that, those things work and you're, you're meeting with families and um, psychology, sociology certainly come in handy and because um, you're counseling them at times. Um, and then the scientific part is if, you know, if, if there's preparation of the body, you know, there's anatomy going on and, um, mm-hmm. and that's part of the embalming process. Mm-hmm. So, mm-hmm. yeah. So, <coughs> keep um, switching gears here. <laughs> yeah, no, that's okay. Yeah. So, um, have you ever been involved in a case where, say, there had been, uh, you know, some sort of suspicion of foul play or something, where the police got involved, and, you know, it, it how how do, how do they, you know, if the police are there, do they kind of call the shots in terms of what's going to happen, or how does that work? Yeah, and um, many counties in the state now have uh, adopted. Um, or established a connection with a, a bigger medical examiner system. Mm-hmm. So Hubbard County currently is connected with Ramsey County Medical Examiner's Office. Oh. So all the local law enforcements are proxies for Ramsey County Medical Examiners. So they're trained to ask the right questions. Um, um, if it's an unexpected death, if it's um, unwitnessed death, um, and there's something that's not quite right. Um, they can figure it out, and then they, we're not part of that process. Mm-hmm. Years ago, we were. I was right. a, I was a, a, a assistant or a, a deputy coroner. So in, yeah, uh, so I was yeah, going yeah, to ask you about yeah, that. So a yeah. coroner. Does Hubbard County have a coroner? We don't. No, we've adopted the Ramsey County as our coroner system. So Ramsey County mm-hmm. Medical Examiners. So they they call the shots. They make all the decisions. They they get in information from 
their dep you know their proxies as the deputies locally in the police department and then they make the determination if there'd be a further investigation typically if the person's been been sick and it's unexpected death you know um, there are times where um, the age comes into factor their yeah. their health history um, if it's just a sudden death and there's no explanation or accidental death um, they're going to be involved they're going to they're going to request that the body is transported to their facility for an exam so oh. yeah and where's yeah. that that's downtown st paul well, so yeah. the body would yeah. get transfer transferred all the way to st paul yeah right. yeah so yeah. The, when it goes on the death certificate it always says cause of death right if so is it them who make that determination yep in a in in a case where they're involved in their they're investigating what happened, um, and especially if there's no medical history at all, uh -huh. they have to come up with something. Uh, they would. They've got a whole series of tests, uh, chemical tests, and and um, they're checking for all, and they're double testing everything, and it takes uh, eight weeks to get those results sometimes. So oh my we're we're on yeah. hold for that final cause of death. Yeah. Um, in a lot of those cases, but. If someone is at you know at home under hospice and we they have hospice care and they have established medical history, you know the cause of death is not a problem at all. Right. Yeah. So they probably just don't even need to get involved in it at all. No. Yeah. No, they don't. No. But and then if it's in a you know um, a formal um, medical establishment like a hospital or nursing home. Um, the medical examiner is not involved at all. So, unless there's a fall or an accident, then they would be. But so yeah. you you had uh, for um, for a while worked as an assistant coroner in, mm -hmm. in Hubbard County. Yeah, we had yeah. our own we had our own corners yeah. corners here. A couple doctors they did a great job yeah. over the years, and they this is kind of like a like forensic work in a way, right? Yeah, yeah. They're just kind of the stopgap, but if. Mm -hmm. um, in, and we always relied on an outside source for um, pathology. So they would just do the initial investigation. Yeah. Uh, and then if needed to go at one time, we could go to Fargo to get pathology. Um, we could go to Fergus Falls. We could go to Brainerd. Um, and none of those services are offered anymore. Mm -hmm. So primarily... Um, we just go to Ramsey County now. So, yeah. Have you ever, I mean, during that time, did you ever uh, have to testify as a witness or anything like that? No, I never did. In any kind of criminal did. case or no. anything like that? No, I never did. Yeah. No. Yeah, it's, it, it was, uh, everything, yeah. There's been a couple, you know, the uh, difficult situations you can imagine. Sure. You know, um, but nothing ever came up where I had to be recalled in, into a court situation. But, yeah. My grandpa was a coroner in Clearwater County when yeah. I grew up, so that was the way it was back in the day. You were appointed, they, you and he did some invest. You know, he did it for sixty years. Yeah, um, things were simpler back then. Well, you yeah, know, I yeah. just with it, it comes to mind is the scene. I think it's Vertigo. I think at the end of Vertigo, where the coroner is giving his report and it's all dramatic and everybody's sitting oh, in the room sure. and listening to him read his report and stuff like that. You yes. know. And, they know what they're doing. Yeah, pathologists. They're the highest, yeah, most trained doctors out there. You know, uh huh. So eight or twelve years of school, more or medical school. The yeah. you're talking about for the like medical examiner, yeah. forensic yeah. pathologists, yeah. and yeah. all that. Yeah, they are sharp, sharp people. Yeah. They're well, we're not. I mean, you're yeah. a sharp person. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um. All right. What happens in a sad case where a person expires and there's no one there to, um to claim the decedent. Yeah, yeah, there are times that does happen. Um, there's usually someone that's been an advocate, you know. Mm -hmm. um, I can think of times where a friend has, has fulfilled the role of um, the, the right to control what happens. Um, and one of the things that we're obligated to is, is um, is to the rule, the rule of the law um, in Minnesota is that the next of kin can 
is, is has the right to control the funeral. Okay. So there are times where if you have a um, situation where a couple's lived together, but they're not married. Right. Um, and then one of them passes away, it can become an issue that it falls outside of their relationship, but goes to the familial relationship. So we have to follow that. Most of the time it's not a problem, but mm-hmm. there's times where it's um, it's difficult. Um, there's some sticky points in there. Yeah. And if someone comes to us ahead of time and I know of that situation, a simple signature can turn your right to control your funeral over to anybody you'd like. Yeah. So it, uh, it can supersede. If I if I if I wanted you to control my funeral, I could have you. Sign, I could sign a document saying that you'd have, and then my family wouldn't have to wouldn't be involved if I don't have a family. So, so that works. Can, that works as like yeah. almost like a will then in a way. Right. It's right. a it's a special document that's unique to your business. Then yep. I suppose. Right? Yep. Yep. And and uh, it saves a lot because in those cases um, that couple know each other more better than anybody else. Sure. You know. And, yeah. Mm-hmm. And they would. Um, and in um, the for the not a power of attorney document, but the living will yeah. for medical purposes, they have they put in a section in there where you can upon my death, I want this to happen, and I want this person to control my funeral. Yeah. So um, in those living wills, the, the, um, they should not the living wills. It's um, with the medical. Your medical, what is it? As the, um, yeah, I know what you, I know what you, I know the document you're referring yes. to. Yes. Anyway, uh-huh. yeah. But anyway, in there, it it's it has a section that um, you can designate anybody you'd like to control your funeral. All right. Um, so so part of that is legal, right? And right. then part of that, part of the planning process goes with um, the funeral home, right? Right. So. What's the what is the um, what's your advice or what's your recommendation in terms of when people should start thinking about their funeral and making those plans and decisions? I think you know it's never too early, it's, it's never too late. Um, certainly, I know <laughs> when I started in the business, we had um, I worked in a funeral home in Virginia, Minnesota, and. One of the guys that worked there handled all the people that wanted to do pre-needs. And and we worked kind of under him. And the first thing he made me do was to pre-arrange my own funeral. Really? Yeah. As a 24-year-old, a 22-year-old mortician apprentice, yeah. I, grew, I planned my own funeral. That's a really good way to teach somebody said, that. If yeah. you're going to be discussing these things with other people... Um, you need to do your own too. So wow. I can remember picking out pallbearers and music and uh-huh. where I'd want my funeral at. And so um, it, there are times where. Um, do you still have that it, same plan, or did you change it? I've changed it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It was just a little booklet back then. Uh-huh. I I don't even know if I have it on yeah. hand anymore. But um, I remember him. I can't remember his name, but I yeah. remember what he made me do. Um, <laughs> um, but yeah, there's, it's never too early, never too late. And really making funeral pre-arrangements is just getting th- something written down, you know. Mm-hmm. Get it written down what you'd like. Um, otherwise, there are certain things that will need to be decided on that maybe the family is going to second guess. Like, are we doing the right thing? Sure. What would mom want? What would dad want? So much um, easier if they yeah. have that direction. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Um, in my own case... Um, my mom lost a good friend when she was probably in her early 50s, maybe even 40s. But um, and she, Barb had died suddenly, and it was it was tough on her. And she just saw that how, on you know, it's it just was, it it made her think about her own death. So she she made her own prearrangements, and then when we'd be home. For Christmas or be at the house for a dinner, she'd always say, "I got that file in my office. If something ever happens to me," uh, and we're like, 
Uh, you know, that's exactly the way that I am, too, because <laughs> yeah. my mom says the same thing, and I don't want to hear it either. Yeah, yeah we just what, close why, our eyes. Yeah. We're all morticians. We're closing right. our eyes. Oh, <laughs> so, if you're a mortician yeah. and you're... Okay, I feel yeah. a little bit better <laughs> yeah. about myself then, I guess. Yeah. 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 <laughs> but it was, um, you know, sitting with families in, in, in a, uh, you know, a, a tragic death, um, and, it, and it's, you know, there's... Not tension, but there's there's just so much stress going on, and 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 you you just know that how tough it is for that family, you know what they're going through, and then just thinking about you know we're not anybody's we're not, none of us are immune from that, we we all are vulnerable to losing somebody, and then and then my mom dies in a car accident, so you really hit home, man, but maybe a day or two afterwards we're. She's got a file. She's got her own preemie. You know, she she yeah. sat down and figured it all out. She so we went. Let's go find her file in her office, and we did. And it was such a gift. We could open it up and say, you know, she had music for the organist, music for the soloist. And she had her songs were picked out. Her scriptures were picked out. She wanted specific flowers you know so it's just really nice to know so much less this to is, think yeah, about right yeah and then yeah. and then no 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 argument yeah, between no, the siblings this is what we want and this yeah. is how it's going to be this is what she wanted so you feel good about that and you know she even had um picked out she wanted her spray on the casket to be made of pine boughs and birds of paradise because the pine is where she's from whoops yeah and then she's going to paradise. So, wow. I mean, she really thought it out. And it was really, really helpful for us. That is uh, really, yeah. yeah. And she was, you know. Well, it's like, it's like a gift that you give to your children, yeah. right? At yep. the end, that just they don't have to worry about any of that stuff. And Some people really want, are, are, they, they know that just a little bit of planning is going to go a long way, you know. And it's, it's information that, you know, we're we're compiling an obituary, doing a life history, a biography of a person, and I don't have to find that information, but I have to get the information from the family. And if how do you how do you know exact dates? How do you know exact right. places and yeah. schooling and that all that all that to have to piece all of that together? Yeah. yeah. And, and if if I don't write my own obituary, someone has to, else has to write it. And, and I'm that the, could be I'm really the best, tough for them. I'm the best expert on myself, <laughs> so I should I should write my own obituary. Yeah, you know? yeah, yeah. That's a very practical uh, yeah. way to yeah. to think about it. Yeah, it really is. And are there are there other like, um, you know, like you could uh, if a person was young, like in their twenties or thirties or something like that, and they wanted to make this. Could they? Is there a way that they can sort of financially um, prepare as well, so that that burden wasn't also on the family? Yeah, and a lot of times if if they want to do a, a payment plan or something ahead of time, yeah, um, we we kind of do our we've got insured uh, life insurance people that sell those plans or can underwrite them. So uh -huh. I'm not a, a licensed uh, insurance person, but we can we can um, we we usually will just write a dollar for dollar annuity. So that's like a one-time lump payment. Uh -huh. So um, and a lot of times families have to reduce someone's assets to be eligible for nursing home stay. Yeah. If, they're, if their assets are dwindling down and they have to apply for medical assistance, mm -hmm. then um, we're, we're sheltering funds ahead of time so they don't run out of funding uh, because... In, uh, the nursing home is not going to last long. So those yeah, are yeah. those funds would be exempt from the MA claims, then. Right, right. Yeah. Yes. Okay. So, but yeah, if if someone younger wanted to do that, uh, we normally just tell them to talk to their insurance agent and uh -huh. then get a life insurance policy. Oh, And sure. if you have to pay pay over time, you know, so much a year, um, whatever type of policy you, you like, they'll go through that with you. But. Yeah. Um, so when it comes to insurance, I, we really don't discuss it. We just tell them to go to your agent. You know? Yeah, yeah. Okay. But annuities we can write, no problem. Yeah. Um, and we have to a lot of times. We're, people need to get the funds out of their 
shelter them so they can become eligible for medical assistance. And in the, in that planning process, I would think that they would have the opportunity to pick out things like caskets and headstones and Correct. things like that as mm-hmm. well. And yep. that's a yep. service also that you provide as part yes. of the... Yep, uh-huh. yep. I, I meet... We've got a full um, a person that does a lot of our pre-needs. His mm-hmm. name is Sean, and that's all he does. And he works... That's all he does is all the pre-needs. He does... We do lunch and learns where people come into the funeral home and... Huh. Um, groups of 15 to 20 yeah, do. yeah and Sean runs all those and he does a great job um, and then he follows up with all those people that um, are still healthy but they want to you know they want to they want to put their pre-arrangements together so and they want to fund them too so uh, you can it's very easily done mm-hmm. and, and I mean this a simple pre-need is getting all that information written down I mean, yeah, that's equally as important as, as putting the funding away ahead of time. Sure. So, yeah. Sure. Yeah. Okay. Um, well, we talked a little bit about this before, but I was was wondering um, what sort of qualities or characteristics would a person have to have to be successful um, in in your business? I you know I think at the core it's just. Um, um, wanting to help people um like any other profession you're you're there when people need you need you the, the, the most you know mm-hmm. um but you know empathy is definitely if you if you don't have empathy for families um why are you in this business you know why, if you really don't want to help well if you can't feel what they're feeling, you know, and you ha- you can only go so far with that too. But well, I was, yeah, yeah, I was going to yeah, say yeah. because if it occurs on a daily yeah, basis and yeah. you're feeling what they're yeah. feeling, I mean, that yeah. must does. Do you ever do you ever get a sense of, or do you ever, people ever ask you? I should say, like, isn't that a depressing l- line of work or something like that? Yeah, I mean, and everybody grieves differently. Uh huh. You know, I, my, my, I'm talking about my mom when I, we all grieve different differently, and we're all morticians. Sure. You know. Um, but you know, it's, there's a lot of that happens all at once with being a mortician and stay on top, seeing on top of everything and making sure the deadlines are met. And right. so the attention to detail is important. Um, and then, um, just, you know, willing to put yourself out there and, and, and willing to help people, I guess, uh, you know, and. Some people, it's just not going to work because they don't want to work weekends. They don't want to work holidays, um, and you know you're you're not. Well, somebody's got to do yeah. it, right? Yeah. I mean, it's sort of yeah. like saying I want to be a police officer, but I don't want to work holidays, or you right. know, right, right, right. right. <laughs> sort of, yeah. Well, it kind of goes with the territory. Uh, it's one of those yeah. jobs, or I want to be a doctor, and I don't want to work on holidays, and right, you know, or, mm-hmm. or weekends, or anything like that. It seems like an unrealistic expectation. Right, right. It, it, yeah. But it's. I hope it changes with the availability of the the lack of morticians right now. So. Yeah. Uh, um. So, Caleb. So Caleb could be a mortician, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. actually. Yeah, I think he's got what it takes. I don't know if he's maybe interested in that or not. We can talk to him after. Yeah, about we'll talk this to him. Get him an apprenticeship yeah. or something, but. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> he's shaking his head. Don't go, don't go. <laughs> um, all right. Um, so the que- uh, another question that uh, I guess would sort of come up as somebody who's so used to, um, you know, dealing with, with uh, mortality and everything like that is, where, do you believe in the concept of the human soul? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, if... You can't. You it would be really hard to be a mortician without those beliefs. And then, you know, just that you know, I've always known Christ as my savior. So I mean, there's never been yeah. a time in my life I can remember yeah. not knowing Him. So yeah, um, you do have to be centered. You do have to have a deep faith. I, I, I'm sure there's morticians out there that don't. But right, it, it would. Um, but they're they're yeah. few and far between. It would yeah. seem, right? Yeah, and I, yeah. you know, you can't wear your faith on, but you sure can share it at certain times. And, uh-huh. um, you know, we're 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 pretty much a Bible based 
community here. So I think you're right. Yeah. 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 Well, um, you know, the, the, the Bible speaks of the concept of giving up the ghost, right? As being the time when, when the, the soul leaves the body. What, what is it that you think is sort of the, the actual exact moment of death? I mean, is it when the heart stops beating or, you know, when, there's, when there ceases to be a brain activity? And you can answer this from, from any, any angle. Wow. Yeah. yeah. Didn't see yeah. that one coming. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the easiest way to say that is a physical death. Yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah. yeah. When your heart stops or when your body stop, stops functioning. Um, when do we lose, when do we transfer from this life to the next? Yeah. I, um, I you know, uh, it's thinking of my dad and, and being with my grandpa when he passed away, you know, you and, and then talking with families all these years, um, especially in a hospice situation, you're, they're already half into that world a lot of times. They're coming back and forth. They're seeing people yeah. that comfort them. They're seeing, um, my grandpa would, would put his arms out before he died, and the pastor was right with us. And yeah, I've seen that a lot. Mar- pastor Marty goes, I've seen that a lot. And it's what, oh, he's probably sees Christ and yeah. he's being greeted. And, <laughs> and he just laid back down, and an hour later he was gone. But you know, um, so we're, we're getting glimpses. Of the next life, you know, I think yeah. as we approach death, um, my dad had that happen to him too, and I've, like I said, I've heard a lot of families talk about that. Yeah. I was going to ask, like, have you yeah. ever, have you ever actually spoken to someone who, you know, like you've been summoned and, and they said, you know, it's 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 time for you to be here, only for only for them to come back and and, you know, basically say that uh, I've seen what was what it was like on the other side or anything like that. No. I have never had that happen. Yeah. No. It would be kind of interesting. Yeah. Or you see, you <laughs> see, um, what, you know, I've seen a little uh, profiles on people that have been interviewed that claim that they've left their body. Yeah. You know, I've seen that too. Yeah. yeah. I was with, just wondering if. And, they, yeah. and, it, and it's like they've gone, some of them have gone so far where they, it's such a beautiful thing that they don't want to come back. That's a comforting. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I mean, and, yeah. and then they come back knowing that you know, life on Earth is is um, we suffer a lot, you know, but we have peace in our faith and, and peace in Christ. So, mm-hmm. um, but yeah, it, it yeah you, you know there's a great thing ahead, you know, and you yeah. you know, you, um, do we fear that? No, I, we fear the process. Yeah. Um, am I scared to die? Yeah. I just don't want to, you know, I'm not scared of dying. I just don't want to be there when it happens. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, I think isn't it, it's impossible for, for, well, no, your soul will be there. Right, right. <laughs> but your, but your pain will be, will be gone. Yeah, yep, right? we've been, we'll all be healed, you know, mm-hmm. yeah. And so, we'll get new yeah. bodies. Yeah, we'll get new bodies, yep. right. <laughs> mm-hmm. yeah. Yeah, I know, uh, it's funny that you get, when my mom died, um, my my neighbor at the time came over and she's a sweet sweet person and they were you know consoling me and and um, telling me you know how sorry they were and um, and she gave me a big hug and she left my porch and she took about ten steps and she turned around and she looked back at me and she said oh Kent don't don't forget your mom will come back to you someday you know and. My mom will come back to me, huh? She'll she'll make contact with you, you know. Uh-huh. It's like, but never heard of that before. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and within, I was with a friend. We were out hunting, um, in South Dakota, and my mom loves sunsets. And we'd finished hunting and cleaning the birds for the day. And I remember something drew me to the sunset, uh-huh. you know, and then very, very definitely, I got a great feeling that yeah. my mom is fine and you yeah. need to you need to move on you know yeah. you know i'm fine mm-hmm. uh, but she, she definitely i had a connection there so well, if, what, yeah, what yeah. an amazing experience yeah. what a yeah. you know, what a blessing yeah. i thought gwen you were right mm-hmm. my yeah. mom did come back yeah <laughs> <laughs> but yeah so people do have 
you know, the human mind is just amazing that um, how we get through things. But yeah. you know, at the at the end of the day, it's that family that supports each other and um, helps each other through grief, um, communities, connections. Um, you know, Zach and I are in Rotary together, and um, that's like a family because right. everybody's working towards one goal, yeah. and we're always looking out for each other. You know, right. Right. Um, so you you really if you, if you didn't have that in life. How difficult life would be, you know, can be, you know. Yeah. Community so, is very blessing. important. Yeah. So I, I, I'm totally mm -hmm. blessed mm -hmm. with my family and and my support system and yeah. how we help each other and connect. So it's it's um, it's yeah. People, you know, think about I'm getting ready, you know, in my retirement time, and so yeah, you look at the your career and and, and think how how interesting it was. <laughs> it, yeah, it certainly yeah, is. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. So you, know, you work a lot on weekends. You work a lot of holidays, but um, in the end, <coughs> yeah, you, know, you can feel pretty good about being there for people. You know, yeah. and, and it probably also feels good that you have a legacy of other family members that are going to continue in that right, too, right? Right. Yeah. And it, it, there are times where I'll just come into a room where someone had passed away, and everybody looks at me and they just go, "Oh, thank goodness, can't see her." But, yeah. What am I? Why? Why? Yeah. Just my, just being there for them. Just yeah. And they, they just, accept. You know, let out a breath. Oh, now yeah. we can relax. Now everything's gonna be okay. Yeah. Hey, it's only me. <laughs> well, yeah, 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 but but I mean, it, it yeah. it's gotta yeah. be a huge yeah. relief yeah. to yeah. people when they see that. Okay, somebody they know. What are we somebody, gonna do? Yeah. Right. Somebody yeah. exactly. Yeah. 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 And that's that. It took a while to get used to that. You have that effect on people. But you have to be conscious of that too. That you know, and there are times where oh, it's can't do with what's yeah. he doing here. <laughs> yeah. Well, and yeah, I mean, it also yeah. I think it also requires a person to have a certain level of gravity and and yeah. you know a certain demeanor, right? Right. You're right. You're right. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. Yes. That, that, and that's something that can only be taught through observation, too, I would think, and something that you would pick up from your grandfather and your yeah. father and you know, the, the previous generations and yeah. things like and that. Just, too. I, the older that, the more I have served in, in the profession, it's like the less surprised I am about things sometimes. It's like, yeah. yeah, it doesn't surprise you know, me. I, I find that yeah. too is like well, you know, for yeah, when you're younger, yeah. you're you think everything is like, oh no, this is yeah. the end of the world. Yeah, like yeah. I'm not going to be able to figure this problem out. Yeah, and then as you get older, you start to realize. Well, you start to see the same thing happening over and over again. You say, right. you know what, I got through it that time, and I'm going to get through it this time. And it's just sort of that confidence mm -hmm. that you get at with experience, right? Yeah, you're right. Yep. Do you ever get to be interviewed in your podcast? Um. <laughs> I don't know if I, well, I'm sure I could. Yeah. yeah but nobody's, nobody's, nobody's ever. So you, I well, mean, actually, just, we, just we were thinking your, about that. Yeah. <laughs> it would be fun to interview. And it's like, uh, you have, well, uh, you grew up out, out east, right? Well, I actually, I grew up in, in Duluth and Duluth. Stillwater. Okay. And then, and then I went out east when I graduated from high school. Okay. You went but, to school out there. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, I went to school out. Yeah, out, out east and law school and all that okay. too. And then I practiced law in New York for like I don't know how many years it was. Fourteen years or something in, like that. In Manhattan. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Wow. Man Good. Manhattan the whole time. Okay. Yeah. Lived on the island. I did. Yeah. 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 And uh, fun. So, yeah, it's a lot of fun. <laughs> what be Times Square. No, that's fun. Night. But, well, <laughs> that's not. You know. You know. It. That's, Before eight p.m. <laughs> you, you. Most of the time. You know, tourists and, or that that Times Square is area is associated with tourism and yeah. Broadway and all yeah. that stuff. You know, so it's pretty rare that the local people would be would out be there. Yeah, and it really just depends on your age group and the set that you're with and everything else too about where yeah. you're gonna go. You know, I think when we were when you know when I was you know going back to the last days that I had in New York the last few years, even though I lived in Manhattan, I spent most of my time I think in in Brooklyn. Um, Did you? Yeah, because that's where all that the, our friend group used to gravitate would be more more in Brooklyn, and like Williamsburg and Park Slope and all those kind of places. Sure, sure. Goes with your age group and all that, but yeah. What do you miss the most? Um, yeah, what do I miss the most? Gosh, you know, I I there's a time and a place for everything. I think, and you know, I think a lot of people like when it comes to New York, 
you want to go to New York to see, hey, can I make it in New York and all that? Yeah. And, you know, am I, am I going to be able to do this? And, you know, I, I proved that to myself over the years. But then I think you, you either get to a point where you say, I love New York and I just want to keep going with this. Or you get to the point in your life where you're questioning yourself, like, what am I doing here? You know, and I and I fell, fell more into that latter category. Um, of course, I have, uh, you know, a, a few good friends there who I miss, but I can still I can still see them from time to yeah. time. But just as far as the daily living is concerned. I, I prefer to live here <laughs> uh, mm -hmm. a lot, a lot more. But um, I, I'd say if there's one thing, it would be sort of just like the different variety of food and stuff that you can oh, get. Sure. You know, yeah. Um, yeah, that would be great. That'd be hard to get. Uh, get not, yeah. To, once you've tasted all those great places yeah. and, and get used to it. And then, I, you know, it's sort of like, too, it's like with anything else, you're, you never know what's going to happen when you walk out on the street. It, you know, you you could see some strange, oh, strange boy, <laughs> things, and there's never a lack of uh, you know something going on, or mm -hmm. you know some event, or you know some, you know if you're into concerts or sports or anything like that, yeah. you know you've got the you've got so many opportunities to do things there. But you know, I think I I, I did all my uh, fair share of that, and. Um, and so, yeah, well, I'm happy to be back here now. So, and being a part of our Rotary Club. Yes. And um, so, I know Great your group. your buddy, your running buddy, uh, Mark Anderson's gonna gonna come before you. Right. And then your your presidency will come up after that. So yes. So are you are you prepared for the for the uh, attending all the board meetings and uh, all that stuff now? Yes. <laughs> so now I get to do all that. It, it yeah. is. Uh -huh. It's a lot of meetings, and it, the nice thing about yeah. Rotary is that. Um, Again, it's it's kind of a legacy in our family. My dad was, that was so important to him, especially mm -hmm. after the death of my mom. Yeah. Rotary became a very important thing to him. Yeah. Was so, he was he president of the of the Park Rapids Club? Well, he he was in Bagley. So okay. He, oh, in Bagley. Uh, yeah, he was mm -hmm. past president. My sister's been active there. Yeah. But he did a lot of um, um, foreign projects, mission work. Yeah. So yeah. Mm -hmm. So many mainly Honduras. So. Yeah. So, um, and I got to go on one trip with him in on that. So, yeah. uh, it was a great program. Well, good. Yeah. No, I'm looking forward to being next year. I've got a year to get ready. Do you miss being president? Um. So you switched with Crystal, right? Because of COVID, was it? No, I switched with Esther. Oh, with Esther. Yeah, that's yes. right. Yes, yeah. I think Esther was supposed to come before me. So you and... didn't have a year to prepare then. No, I, I like to kind of, con I like to refer to myself as being a wartime president because it was Dude. right smack sure. in the middle of COVID. COVID. Yes. And I was trying to, because all of our meetings were pretty much on Zoom or else we yeah. did those hybrid meetings where half the people would be on Zoom and then half the people were live. And so you'd have to, you know, try to work out with the technology, walking around with a cell phone when you're going around asking people about happy dollars and whatnot, so the people from home could could yeah. hear. Yeah, that's and right. Yeah, that, all that. That was yeah. that was really that was really annoying. Um, you know, to have it, that, but you know, I I, I like being the president at the time. You know, I yeah. felt it was a worthwhile thing to yeah. do, and now yeah, I'm the membership chair, so that that helps to stay involved and, yes. and all that. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, it's a it's a it's a good club. I think it'll always be. We've got a good base of people here, yeah. Yeah. And, uh, and that's where it's. There's so many, you know, great committees that are filled, and they're yeah. they're a force of their own. Yeah. And you just kind of give them what they need. That's exactly yeah. what it is. Yeah. When you're the president, you've yeah. got so many other good people working. Yeah. So, yes. Good. Well, Kent, um, it's been a real pleasure uh, talking with you today. It's been and, fun to be here. I'm glad that you yeah. invited me. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. I'm looking forward yeah. to working with you yeah. on Rotary and yes, and um, you know if. Uh, Anybody um, has any questions about any of this funeral planning stuff? I'm sure that you know they could call uh, Cease Funeral Home in yep. Park Rapids, and we'll be glad to answer any questions they have. Yeah. Absolutely, yeah. Ken Cease, thank you for joining me. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks, Caleb. And thank you, Caleb. Yes. <laughs>